humans are what we care about. So we built a virtual reality um, chamber, essentially, where people can have very realistic experiences of diving with great white sharks, of heights, of attack dogs, you know, pick your, pick your poison. And then we look at their behavior and we're measuring their breathing, their heart rate, et cetera. And in some cases, because we have access to patients from neurosurgery, we're actually recording from the human amygdala with wires dropped down below the skull into the human amygdala. So here's what we're finding, that there are certain modes of confrontation to to threats. And what threats, I don't mean doing something stupid, like jumping in front of somebody with a gun just because you think that's a good idea. I mean, things like leaning into uh, challenging uh, mental work, learning hard, you know, strain and, and hard thinking, leaning into hard physical work, et cetera, that is intensely rewarded over time. It's tied in with the dopamine system. There we go, with dopamine again. This circuitry is tied into the dopamine system such that over time, the stress response comes to be interpreted differently, that that feeling of internal arousal, heart beating faster, lungs breathing faster, um, pupils dilated, the so-called stress response actually starts to become a positively reinforced um, experience. Now, this um, brings up notions of Carol Dweck, my co also a colleague at Stanford's growth mindset. Growth, uh, Carol's a close collaborator of mine now. Growth mindset is one of these things that's sorely misunderstood. So just briefly, um, and I think uh, Carol would approve of this definition, growth mindset is not just believing that you can get better. That's part of it, right? If you do hashtag growth mindset on Instagram, you get millions of hits. <laughs> and the things that are related to it are not often really growth mindset. But first of all, you have to believe that you can be better. Second of all, what Carol had discovered is that there's about 8% of kids that have this so-called growth mindset, where even though they knew they couldn't get the right answer on an exam, they were highly motivated to do these really hard problems. Growth mindset is about getting dopamine reward from friction, from effort, and from strain, which is different than thinking about the outcome. And inevitably, people or kids that have growth mindset are spec perform spectacularly well. So this, the way to adopt this is to think when you're in the most painful point of something that you're exactly where you need to be, that you're, that you're on the ladder, so to speak. It's not, and it's not, as Carol and I often talk about this, it's not being delusional and saying, oh, I'm winning. Because actually positive thinking, sometimes you're actually badly wrong. If you think you're winning, like a, and this is bad because I, I would never spar him. But like, I remember in the Algerie um, Pacquiao fight, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I like boxing. My grandfather fought and was also a biochemist. And so like, we have that relationship over time. And I watched, you know, I watched that fight and, you know, Algerie was like badly outdone. And he was in his corner and his coach is telling him, you're doing great. You're winning. You're winning. Yeah. That I is not that. growth mindset. No. Okay. That is called, uh, that's called just false that's just called, that's just, that's lying. Delusion. Yeah, delusion. Yeah. Now I think he was making his best effort and, you know, I sometimes go Long Island. So I hope if I show up in Huntington, they don't beat me up because that's where Jerry is. But I think they understand what I'm saying. That telling yourself you're winning when you're actually losing is wrong. You're, but that's because you're comparing where you are now to the outcome you want. Mm. The key in, is to compare yourself of where you are now to where you're, you need to be in the moment. And so the strain and effort of the moment is the, is the thing to pay attention to. You know, we put so much emphasis on paying attention to the long-term goal that sometimes we forget that if you pay too much attention to the long-term goal, you're going to start judging where you're at relative to that goal. So one thing that we've been exploring in humans is the extent to which people who can take on adaptive decisions can take that uh, adaptive behaviors, can take that stress response and kind of move the horizon in closer and just focus on, okay, I'm in a high stress regime. This is really painful. We see this in uh, we work on people with generalized anxiety who are trying to overcome fear of heights and just walking across a virtual height plank can be terrifying for them. But if they can get one step in front of the other, despite high levels of anxiety, they can eventually overcome that. And so we've been looking at everything from how breathing affects the anxiety response to heart rate, pupil size, et cetera. I'd be happy to talk about all that in as much detail as you like. But I think the principle to take away is this, that the growth mindset is not about suppressing anxiety so that you're able to move, cruise through things with ease. That's just one part of it. It's really about trying to understand that stress response as key to your growth. It's absolutely key. And I think people that you know lift weights or run long distance or are involved in competitive sports, they fundamentally understand this, but even they kind of migrate away from it over time where we, recovery is super important, but you need the stimulus, right? And the stimulus for growth is that stress response. And if you think about it, evolutionarily, Let's say we were all living in a little clan here in the Onnit offices, and we didn't know anything about the outside world. We would start to 
kind of eventually what drove people to leave was they didn't have enough of what they needed. There was just sort of the seeking, right? So if you had enough, everything, you had enough mates, enough food, enough water, you'd be fine. But at some point there was some deprivation. And so we had to do a risk benefit analysis. And so it was really about taking that anxiety and venturing out into the unknown to find resources. Some people died and some people succeeded and they were rewarded. And with that reward came the idea that, ah, there's something about looking out into the environment that's useful that can allow me to have more than I have in the moment. But you can't divorce yourself from the anxiety of wondering whether or not things are going to turn out okay. You can't divorce yourself from the anxiety of, of strain and effort. There's just simply no way. And in fact, you weren't really designed to do it. So to kind of peel this around to a practical answer because I often listeners and you know and people want to know well, what do I do with this is you know I think the field of wellness and biohacking and high performance is great but it lacks definition so one thing I'd really like to see more of in the in these communities and in the scientific community for that matter is m- more careful definition like what is mindfulness like really what what are we really talking about what is stress and what are stress mitigation processes that are useful so one thing I think is really useful is think about real-time tools versus offline tools. I believe personally that everybody, whether or not they're MMA fighter, they're in a CrossFit, they're running ultras, or they're a student in class that doesn't do anything physical, whatever it is, has four tools. One tool to get you to mitigate your stress response in real time. So let's say the stress response hits. You need to keep it, you can't let it go too high or too low. You know, you don't want to suppress it, but something to do that. You also probably want an offline tool that allows you to raise your ceiling on what stress feels like. You know, I'm buds with Wim and I've known him for a long time. And like, you know, I think Wim Hof breathing is in particular is a useful tool for kind of shifting your perception of what stressful is. But it's an offline tool. It's not, you can do it in real time, but it's not, you're not going to start Wim Hof huffing in the middle of your like rolling jujitsu because your breathing has got to be devoted to other things. So you need offline tools and real-time tools to to cope with stress. And I think people need real-time tools and offline tools to bring themselves into heightened states of arousal, right? So there are times when there's, when you're actually too low on the arousal plane and the key is to get higher up there where you can access even better levels of performance. And so I think the, the so-called autonomic nervous system, it, it's absolutely under our control. It's a total misnomer. It's just that your heart rate and your breathing are taken care of on their own. You don't need to flip the on switch. You wake up every morning and you know if everything's going well, your breathing and your heart rate is going the way it should. But you absolutely have levers that you can control and move in order to shift those. And I think that um, there's been a lot of focus on like, okay, breathing is a great tool or you know, the ice bath is a great tool, but we really aren't thinking about what they're best for. And as a result of that, I don't think they'll ever evolve past where they are unless we start thinking, okay, like what's the utility of breath holds? No one can tell me. Like, so my lab is very interested in like, in trying to figure out what the utility of breath holds is. Is it better at letting you deal with adrenaline in your system? Is it better at get carbon dioxide tolerance? You know, um, for all the, the incredible tools that are out there, there isn't a lot of uh, good information about systematic ways to approach it. And I don't want to peel everything down to like a really reductionist approach. You know, I'm friends with Brian McKenzie and those guys. And, mm-hmm. you know, and Brian's about as reductionist as you get in the breathwork community. And I love how quantif- you know, how he loves to quantify everything. That's one of the things that initially brought us together um, as friends and as, uh, as, you know, sort of informal collaborators. But I think that this world of biohacking needs definition. You know, it's, it's kind of ironic that in the weightlifting community, they've really worked things down to a, a kind of a fine science. Whereas in the endurance community, it's kind of like whoever you're listening to seems to be the person who knows the most. And I don't claim to know everything or the most at all. I just would like to see sharper definition on all this stuff about stress, stress mitigation, ice baths, breathing, and so on. And so my lab has been exploring the extent to which different breathing protocols or different hypnosis protocols. Hypnosis is one that we're really interested in. It's used medically and we're interested in it as a stress mitigation tool and a tool for high performance. To what extent those tools can be leveraged to make people, to allow people to make themselves better. 